It's no secret that writing can be lonely work, but does it really have to be? Whether you're full-time, part-time, or just starting out, you'll get insights into the tricks, tips, and production habits of writers from every level of the biz. From best-selling authors to those launching their first novels, you're sure to be in the company of friends as we encourage great writers to divulge and share their secrets. This is The Great Writer Share Podcast with your host, best-selling author, Daniel Wilcox. Hello and welcome to the Great Writer Share podcast with me, Daniel Wilcox, where every week I natter with some of the friendliest and most hardworking writers around today, forcing them to divulge their secrets, share their wisdom and bear their souls, all for the sake of helping you, the listener, advance your writing career. Today's date is the 12th of September. It's a blustery day over here in sunny old England. Just got back from producing the words and now I'm having the fun of putting this podcast together and bringing you someone who I feel is very, very interesting and actually Although my format tends to run for about an hour, uh, an hour long in your ears, I did want to go on for a little longer with Rami and would have, um, but we were on quite a strict timeline with this one. So it's a shame I couldn't dig into more with Rami on this one. I got loads out of this. I'm sure you guys will too. But uh, I'll definitely have to get him back on for a part two because he's a very interesting guy and there's lots to kind of drill in on with him. Um, So... Just to go over some of the main topics that we cover in this interview, we talk about how or why Rami writes urban fantasy. Urban fantasy, as I understand it, is quite a a new genre still, something that seems to be producing a lot of success for people. If you look into the urban fantasy uh, subcategories on Amazon, there's a whole wealth of different types of urban fantasy. There are people with thousands and thousands of reviews on there, loads of downloads. It's very, very popular right now. And, and it's easy to see why there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, so we go a little bit into what urban fantasy is and why he writes it. We talk about how to build a strong story um, from beginning to end of a novel as well as beginning to the end of the series. And spoiler alert, and something definitely to stick around for, for fans of the Gone God World series, which is uh, Rami's main series, he does give the actual final line to what the entire series is going to wrap up to be way before he's even reached it. So I, th- I think that's really interesting because... Me, personally, as a writer, I will never look that far ahead. I I like each step just to be a bit of a guessing game for me, which is quite fun. But yeah, if uh, if you're a fan, stick around for that. And we also talk a little bit how Rami is building his series, engaging with readers and fans. Loads and loads of stuff to cover in there, so stick around for that. But before we get into that, just going to give a quick shout out to patreon.com forward slash the great writers share. We have no new patrons this week, but just a reminder that for as little as $1 a month, that's less than a cup of coffee, particularly in today's society. I paid two seventy for a latte earlier. Horrendous. Um, but for as little as $1 a month, you can jump and join us and support us over at patreon.com. And uh, over there, you get a load of extra advantages. So you'll get to ask uh, upcoming guests any questions that you might have. You get every episode early. And you also can get access into our private Slack group where we've got a bunch of people over there at the minute sort of sharing secrets, just talking to each other and uh, generally having a good time. So to get involved in that, that's www.patreon.com forward slash great writers share. And there will be a link in the show notes. Um, and speaking of the Patreon, last week I announced that the giveaway for this month which uh, is available to all of the patrons who are currently signed up, um, was going to be James Clear's Atomic Habits, which is a fantastic book about how to create systems and processes that help you achieve your end goal by just concentrating on the baby steps instead of the bigger picture. It's it's genuinely a fantastic book, but it's so fantastic that everyone over on the Patreon group seems to have already read it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch it up, and this month instead I'm going to be putting forward for the giveaway book to be Write Better Faster, How to Triple Your Writing Speed and Write More Every Day by Monica Lionel. Uh, Monica is someone who I've spoken to before. She had an, uh, an old podcast a while back and uh, she's very, very motivated. She's got some really good practical advice in there to give to both experienced and novice authors about how to just write more and squeeze more into your writing time without sacrificing quality. So it's definitely a, a, definitely a good read and something that I've taken a lot of practical advice from to help with where I am at the minute. And without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to the wonderful and charming Rami Vance. Enjoy. Rami Vance is a Canadian who lives in Edinburgh with his wife, three-year-old, and imaginary dog. He writes kick-ass urban fantasy thrillers set in the Gone God world and elsewhere, and has recently dipped his toes into the lit RPG genre with the Middengard series, co-written with Michael Anderley. 
Ramey was also the main events coordinator of the 20 Books Edinburgh Conference, and his greatest aspirations are writing more stories and finally getting that real dog so he can have an excuse to go on longer walks. Ramey, welcome to the show. I'm one step closer to the real dog, too, because we finally bought a flat, so... Ah, uh, fantastic. Or it's to contend with. Yeah. And what, what breed of dog are you looking to get in? Uh, something small and, you know, I don't know, just small. Something I can scoop up into my arms and say, bad dog, and like whisk away. I like you start specifically with bad dog. Like you, you're going to buy an ill-tempered dog. I just, I just imagine that, you know, they say that dogs take on the personality of their owners. And I just, I know I get in enough trouble on a day-to-day basis that I can't imagine my dog is not going to get in trouble. So I can believe that. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, maybe, wait, oh, go on. I was just saying a bulldog. Oh, bulldog. Yeah, brave choice. Um, yeah, I, I definitely want to get a dog at some point. I think I mentioned this on the show before. I, uh, I'm kind of in the same situation where I just, I've got a place near me that's quite nice to walk. I definitely want to have a dog that I can use as an excuse just to go out a bit more and just get out into the fresh air and, and have something to walk that isn't a child that runs away from me. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, because you also have a son about the same age as mine, right? Yes. So, and uh, I'm really worried because I will get a dog and I, I'm going to tell my boy, what do you want to name him? And for sure, he's going to pick a Paw Patrol name and I <laughs> myself. So, yeah, you've got to navigate that very carefully. So. Yeah. Which Paw Patrol name would you wish to be pushed onto the dog? <laughs> ah, none of them. None of them. Uh, but I, if I had to, I guess I'd go for Chase. Of course you yeah. would. W- welcome to a show on writing where two dads <laughs> about Paw Patrol because that's our lives now. <laughs> That's it. Just between Paw Patrol, uh, my son's all about Pokemon, so it's everything Pokemon. But he, uh, I get a bit of a break at the minute because he's just started full time at school, so it's all good my side. Um, uh, so, I mean, let's let's jump into talking a bit more about yourself. Obviously, um, me and you met in Edinburgh earlier this year. Um, right. Found you a very interesting guy doing a lot of cool stuff. Um, one of the things, I, one of the places I wanted to start because obviously your primary genre is urban fantasy. And urban right. fantasy is still a relatively new genre for some people. So are you happy to give a bit of an explanation of what urban fantasy is and why you chose to write in that genre? Yeah, so uh, urban fantasy is basically magic in a modern day setting, uh, you know, and there, there, th- there tends to be kind of two dominant groups with urban fantasy, which is that it's either behind the veil, so only a select few know that magic and demons and whatnot exist. And sometimes it's in front of the veil, but even when it's in front of the veil, the average person doesn't know everything. They just kind of know some of what's going on. So that's urban fantasy, broadly speaking. And the reason why I write urban fantasy is really ridiculous. But I used to live in Japan, and this this does relate. This does loop back. So I lived in Japan for three years uh, post university. I got you know teaching English gig. And um, I was in a small town. I was the only English speaker there. I was terribly lonely. Uh, I mean, truly like the loneliest period of my life. And the only English that ever went on TV at any time was 7.30s on Wednesdays, Buffy the Vampire Slayer would play. And I swear to you, that just saved my life. Like, Because I'll be like, okay, just two more days till Buffy. I can get through. <laughs> I was so lonely. And so, uh, and that just really kind of just stuck with me. And, I, and then I started reading the genre, you know, of course, Dresden Files and then into Jack and, you know, like the list just goes on and on and on. Really fell in love with uh, the genre, broadly speaking. And then when it came time to write, uh, it was just the first thing that really popped into my head. So, Fantastic. And one of the things that I've discovered about you or, or, or seen from the work that you've been doing is we met. Well, I say we met in Edinburgh. We actually met in London briefly last year um, at that conference. And one thing that I found really interesting is you started, when you were there, you you did a, um, what they call a book autopsy, where they basically put up the Amazon page of your of your book, showed the cover, read the blurb, and let an entire room of about 100 people just dissect and look at everything that you've got, got going on. Actually, before I move on, how did you find that process? Because that must have been terrifying for you to to have so many writers in the room just looking at your products and just being able to sort of critique and give that feedback. So, so I just want to point out that you're a nice guy. And because you're a nice guy, your brain auto-corrected that to an autopsy when actually what it was was a murder boarding. That's what murder boarding. They were like, we're going to murder board your book. <laughs> so it's just much worse than an autopsy. Yeah. You know? Um, uh, yeah, it, it, I loved it. I, I, 
absolutely loved it because I mean, the biggest struggle that we always get is people telling us not wanting to hurt your feelings and wanting to tell you the truth. And I like, I had at that point, uh, you know, realized that, you know, I wanted to be successful in this game, uh, no matter what. And the only way I was going to get there was if people who were smarter than me told me exactly what they thought. And that's what happened. Um, and, you know, I got a lot of great feedback. And then even post the mur murder boarding, you know, different authors started approaching me and kind of coming up and saying, well, you know, I like this and I didn't like that and change this and change that. And quite honestly, taking the advice of 20 Books London, you know, completely turned my career around in terms of uh, monthly income and just everything like that. So. Uh, yeah, no, it was absolutely fantastic. At the time, of course, like, you know, I was like, oh, oh, God, that hurts. Ow, ow. But, you know, kind of immediately after, as soon as I saw that I was basically given a laundry list of things to improve, I, it was amazing. And how did you find, so going more to how you work on a personal level, had you that humility in you before you went into that murder boarding? Or how did you approach your books before that moment and how is it compared to how you approach them afterwards if you get sort of into some of the specifics of what you took away from that experience yeah uh i i so i never considered myself a good writer i've always considered myself a good storyteller which to me is kind of a, a different um it's a different kind of approach to the thing so I, I get quite sensitive if you tell me the story is no good, but I don't have any problem if you tell me anything else is no good. And so, and so as a result, I can kind of distinguish the two. So when it comes to things like the cover, when it comes to things like presentation, when it even comes to things like writing style, you know, this isn't you know as tight as it could be or any of that stuff. I love that advice because it just means that it gives me the means to tell the story I want to tell. Uh, better, you know, like I'm able to do it in a much more, um, uh, you know, at a higher level and therefore get the story to represent or present better. And so uh, I never really bothered me that kind of stuff. Uh, what, what has bothered me in the past is just people, you know, kind of arbitrarily saying this character doesn't work. It's like, well, what does that mean? Like, how <laughs> How do I use that? Like, I can't work with that. This character doesn't work. Give me something tangible to fix. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then, like you say, from that moment and then sort of onwards to Edinburgh, it seems that a lot of stuff's been happening for you. We we were speaking in Edinburgh and you were sort of introducing me to the people you're working with. You're telling me about all these different projects you're going on. How, what, what does this year look like for you? How, how are you now approaching your writing and what you're trying to produce with the Gone God world with everything else? Because you're really sort of at a point where you seem to be expanding from um, sort of writing these series and then sort of blowing out into some other genres, working with other people? Yeah. So uh, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know if people know what the Gone God world is. So I just give kind of a quick overview. So the, God, the, the premise of the Gone God world is that the gods are gone, all of them. They suddenly packed up and left with this one final message that was, thank you for believing in us, but it's not enough. We're going. Good luck. And then they exiled all their denizens down onto Earth. So things like minotaurs and centaurs, dragons, onis, windigos, you know, mythical creatures of every tradition and religion are kind of exiled onto Earth as second class citizens. So um, originally I had written two series in the Gone God world, and they were both kind of exploring different aspects of, you know, this kind of pressure cooker situation in which human beings have to kind of deal with their own faith or lack of faith, you know, and these mythical creatures who are once immortal have to deal with the fact that they're now mortal and stuck on a plane that doesn't want them, right? You know, they're not home anymore and all of that stuff. And, you know, and it, kind of exploring that. And what I started to realize, especially when the series started to take off, when the universe started to take off and people started asking me questions about, you know, different characters or different aspects of the Gongard world, I realized that this was just way too big for me to write by myself. And so one of the major differences was I started to, uh, started to bring on collaborators. And so I have one writer right now, uh, Siobhan Clark. Uh, however, uh, there are two more who are, you know, 
coming in the wings, which, you know, as soon as it becomes official, we'll do an official announcement about that as well. So that means that I can just kind of release multiple series. And what's fantastic about working with these collaborators is, you know, you start explaining the Gone God world. They, they read what you, you know, what I've written in it. And then they come up with comp- their own characters and their own storylines and their own expressions of what could possibly happen in this crazy universe. So it, it's been fantastic. I mean, uh, quite honestly, the most rewarding experience of my author career is when someone else comes up to you and goes, you know what would be a cool character in your world? And then starts outlining a cool character in your world. And you're like, <laughs> I, would, I would friggin' love to see this character, you know, do X or do Y or, you know, whatever it is, right? And so, and definitely with um, Siobhan, right? Like, my stories are quite, um, you know, fast action, fast paced, hit them hard, move on kind of stuff. Uh, Siobhan, she's a lot more in touch with her feelings, right? And she brought aspects of the Gong Gong world, like like what it means to truly lose your immortality, you know? Like she's really exploring that in her series in a way that I just never could. Like it's just not my personality to do it. And I love what she's producing and I just especially love that it's happening in a universe that I created. So that sounds amazing. And it's it's something that definitely fascinates me. So I've got, as I always do the show, I selfishly bring on people that I feel are going to, you know, have useful nuggets of advice for things that I'm potentially working on in the future. Um, but one one question I do have is when creating something like this, how much of a grasp of the universe that you're building do you feel you need to have before you can start to see that out and let that go? Because obviously there's an element where as you start handing it over to people, like you say, they, they create their own storylines. They start to sort of play a bit more with your original concept. How do you? How much of your ideas do you need to have, and how do you balance uh, other creators from almost diluting some of those ideas that you might have had? Have you had any of those sort of conflicts yet? Yeah, but a good idea is a good idea, right? And so, at the end of the day, like you got to kind of kill your darlings. It used to be kill your babies, but then I had a child, so now it's kill your- <laughs> my wife doesn't particularly like the uh, <laughs> the modification, but. Um, no, I, I mean, like, that's definitely happened. Like, uh, it, you know, so, f- for example, so, okay, so one of the things that I needed to have in place before I could start working with other authors was just quite simply, I needed to be, be able to boil down the essence of the world within kind of 10 sentences or less. And, you know, if we had spoken two years ago or two and a half years ago, it probably would have taken me 20 minutes to distill the essence of the world because I just didn't have it down and I didn't fully understand it. There were aspects of it that were still modifying. And so once you kind of create the core commandments of your universe, um, then it becomes about character consistency. So are the characters consistently existing? So uh, one example, and uh, you know, for those who read everything, um, especially to the end of, and Pinview's Inferno, okay? But I won't actually say what happened just in case you haven't read it, but something happens to a particular character, Mural, at the end of Pinview's Inferno. And I had planned this event for Mural for, like, years. I mean, it was one of the first things that I knew was going to happen in my storyline was this was going to happen to Mural. And I didn't know when, of course, back then, but like, you know, it, this was going to happen and this is, and it was going to set off this whole chain of events. And so when Siobhan came in to write her series, she connected what was happening in her series to what happened to Mural. And it was completely not what I had planned. Like, I mean, as in, you know, like, so the, what happened to Mural still remains, but the, the reason why it happened or how it happens was completely changed and it was much better. So just go with it, right? You know, it was just, it was just a better idea. It was a better way of hand, of handling the, you know, the cause and effect of things. And so, uh, you know, I think that like when you're getting ready to collaborate with other writers, you have to really kind of let go of what is yours and really kind of just embrace what works for the world and what works for um, the the kind of the the individual characters or the individual story progressions um, and then just kind of move on like that. 
And how are you handling the specifics of, so do you have uh, uh, almost like an onboarding doc? How do you manage the communication with the collaborators? Because you're also managing all this around uh, a day job, um, which is, if I remember rightly, around 20 hours a week. So it's sort of like half your week is put into the day job and half is writing your own books, managing collaborations, and obviously previously arranging an event in Edinburgh. How are you? <laughs> but how are you managing it, and how are you? How are you sort of communicating everything you want to to the collaborators for these projects? Yeah. So for the collaborators, um, I've at, uh, so first of all, uh, Siobhan originally and, and still is my editor, so she had read everything, so that was easy. Uh, one of the collaborators was actually a reader, so and she had also read everything, so that that was also easy. And then the other collaborator. Um, uh, basically, I had asked him to read specific things and then kind of come back to me with uh, his, his own ideas and stuff like that. So um, so that was how I kind of onboarded it. And then in terms of the actual onboarding, kind of like uh, the, the Bible, if you will, um, I created uh, a very small document of kind of key points that I kind of go over with everyone. Um, but then, of course, uh, you know, I'm told that it's incomplete, and so that it's always been kind of tweaked and added to because I forget this detail or I forgot that or that, and 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 it does get quite quite bigger and more cumbersome. So one of the things that I kind of realized with, especially with Siobhan, because Siobhan's actually working on her second series in the God God world now, um, and then the other person is also working on a prelude. So stuff that happened before the gods left to kind of set things up now. And so both of them are kind of dealing with three different time periods in the overarching. And one thing I realized was as long as you only have touch points that connect with the other storylines, it becomes much easier. And then, and this is the key point, which I can't really give away here, but all of this is working towards something. Right, and so there, there's a kind of a big end game, so to speak, that's going to happen kind of at the end. And really, what we're doing is, you know, we're establishing the heroes of this world to deal with the end game event. And so, as soon as everyone understands that, you know, we're working towards preparation for that end game, and then we discuss, well, what does preparation for each individual hero mean? What, like, what are they contributing to the end game? What is their role going to be in the end game? And then all of a sudden, the writing just kind of goes in line with, you know, kind of where that is headed. And, and then every now and then an idea is thrown out that completely throws things in the loop. Right? And then you go, okay, well, let me readjust this and see if I can figure it out. So that's kind of how we're approaching it. But you have to understand the team's relatively small right now. It's, it's only... A, four people. So, you know, it's kind of more manageable on that level. How big do you see it getting? Three and a half people because one person <laughs> was still on edge. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. How big do you see it getting? Not much bigger. Uh, I, I don't, I can't imagine the readership being able to maintain more than, you know, 24 books a year. I, you know, cause, and, and maybe I'm completely wrong, and uh, this is where I need to ask you know people like you and other people what they think. But really, I'm you know, so the way I'm kind of approaching it is, is that every series is five and done. So, so you know, you have this succinct, intense storyline, five and done, five and done, five and done, and then each is a component to the end game. And so, so for example, what my hero, Cat Darling, I, I broke this rule just because things got out of control. I kind of broke this rule. It was actually it wound up being six and four, and then she's going to have a third series of five, right? So six, four, and five. So she'll have three series, and really, you can just kind of pick up at any point, and you're fine. So it's just kind of done. Um, but then, anyway, I, I, I kind of. I wish it was that smooth as I just described. It's not quite as smooth as that, but yeah, that's the plan. It's just five and done. You, you present it, you have those uh, flashes, um, you, these intense stories that are all building up to that end game. And then, you know, you just kind of keep moving. And the other thing is, is I don't think at least sitting now that 
you know, I can I, I imagine that the end game will play out in 2021. Right. So we're not we're not that far away. We're we're only gonna have about, you know, three three to five more series of these five and done before the end game finally comes to play. That sounds fantastic. I mean, it sounds like you've got everything sort of played out. I mean, even having the ending ready there and you seem to be quite methodical in how you approach story i mean even behind you you've got sort of papers with notes everywhere about your different series uh, we're obviously not recording video for this but um just for people on the audio feeds you are surrounded by a lot of sort of big white sheets with scribbles on and, and sticky notes everywhere how how right. do you approach story because also part of your day job is teaching story isn't it so how how do you actually approach the sort of construction of say you're just starting a particular book from from beginning to end Right. Yeah, that's that's a great question. And yeah, I call this my beautiful mind wall. So if they ever pull me away, that this is the evidence. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I, okay. So basically, for, for me, it starts. So for me, uh, okay. When we're talking Gone God world, right? It, it ultimately starts with premise. Obviously, like you know. So here's the world. Here's what makes this world unique, and here's the pressures of this world that that you know obviously need to be dealt with on a continuous basis without dealing with these pressures your 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 um you know it's not a gone god world story even if you're using the same characters uh, by ignoring the fact that these guys are you know refugees and they don't quite understand you know human culture so to speak and you know all of these pressures then it becomes a different story about a centaur and a human in new york it's not a gone dog world story, right? So that's one thing. Um, and, and that's, by the way, my favorite thing to play with is the cultural misunderstandings. Like, um, you know, when a changeling negotiates with you, she gets really close and starts blinking rapidly. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's fun things like that because the, so when, when a human is kind of approached by a changeling rapidly blinking, they're like, who is this person having a manic event? <laughs> You know, I don't. I can't deal with this. Like, stop blaming. Okay, fine. Whatever you want. And then the change is like, yes, I want that negotiation. I got what I wanted. You know. <laughs> so, so start with the premise. You know, you kind of start with the flavor, right? And then the next element is the character. So, what does the character want, and what does the character need? They're often, you know, two different things, um, and then often. In pursuing what the character wants, they're denying themselves what they actually need. So that becomes, you know, kind of establishing that kind of internal conflict uh, and then also establishing who is this character, what's the character's background. So this is the main driving force. The other thing that, you, you know, I build into every series and every kind of aspect is who is the Scooby gang, right? So, you know, every hero has sidekicks. And so what makes a sidekick? psychic special, what makes them unique, what are their motivations, what are their internal and external desires and conflicts. Um, and that's really important, again, for the Gone God World flavor, because the whole point is presenting, you know, um, Mergen, the avatar of truth, you know, who is a homeless man in Montreal, right, you know, but back in the Ottoman Empire times, you know, back in the day, he was basically a god, and now he's homeless. And what's worse is he's the avatar of truth. So food for him is truth. So you got to tell him the truth to nourish him. Otherwise, he gets hungry and starts to starve. And then, you know, so, you know, there was a whole subplot where one of my characters was trying to feed out and figure out how to feed Mergen. Couldn't figure out how to feed Mergen. Kept trying to offer him falafels. And he didn't want <laughs> truth. Right. You know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, so what are these kind of secondary characters, these side characters, you know, and how do they add flavor and what are their own individual challenges? And then the next step is to, you know, like I said, um, it's five and done kind of thing. Right. And so, you know, what, what's what's kind of the goal of the five books? You know, what's the end game of those of that five story arc? And then within each book, what are the uh, what I call the five milestones of each book, right? And so all of it just has to kind of work together um, in flow. So the five milestones, uh, as I see them at least, are and I, you know I kind of I play, you know I wa I can't watch a movie anymore without going, yep, those are the five milestones. Figured it out, you know, like it's just 
just ruined all movies for me. But um, it's the setup, you know, how, how does the story start? Like where, you know, what are we establishing in those early chapters? The inciting incident, which, you know, you'd have to have your head in the sand if you don't know what an inciting incident is. Then you got the first slap, right? It's that like darkest before dawn moment. Uh, the second slap, but there's hope. So just when you thought things couldn't get worse, they do. Uh, but there's hope. There's something that's going to carry us into the climax. And, you know, you kind of establish those five points. How can we play with those five points? How do the subplots fit into those five points? Um, and usually just do the first two books, right? And then, um, or the first book and a half, really. And then you start writing. And as you're writing, you're like, oh, I was completely wrong about this. Milestone four is not this at all. It's, that, it's something else. And you kind of modify it and, with it and, and you know, and then the story, you know, manifests, it, it, it almost tells itself, like, especially if you really know your characters, your characters start to do things that you don't expect. And it's awesome because it's just, it's just better story. And so, and then it just builds from there. So does that answer your question? Oh, hundred percent. I mean, there's nothing, nothing I like more really than knowing that it's quite ironic nothing I like more than planning a book and then realizing halfway through that it's gone off in a completely different direction but it's better for it because you find your flow you find what the characters are wanting to do and then it becomes a more um, authentic experience as they kind of approach that climax right yeah I my my absolute I think the best you know of all the books I've written the book that I think is my best work um, well, I, th there are two, but like the one in particular that I'm thinking of is Orphan Follies, which is book four of the Mortality Bites series. And I wrote that entire book believing that character A was the villain, only to get to about, so it's a 55,000 word book, only to get to about 40,000 words into it and go, oh, he's not the villain at all. He's trying to help. And it's like, oh, okay. So, I mean, th that did require a lot of rework, but once you kind of, once the story kind of told you that, it was awesome. It was just like, oh, okay, that's how this works. And I it just loved it, and it, it worked really well, and I, I felt at least. So. Brilliant. Um, one thing I did want to jump into, um, because this interview is steaming by on my side, we're already about 30 minutes into it. Um, we so one thing that I spoke to you about in Edinburgh that I think is probably worth a bit of a chat about is you're quite a big proponent of BookBub and BookBub ads, ads and um, not necessarily talking about the main sort of feature deals, but the the general ads that they run alongside the emails. Are you happy to talk a little bit about why you think they're working for you and any sort of hint, hints and tips for people to if they're already using them how to improve their their BookBub ads to be more effective? Yeah, sure. Um, so. Uh, I like BookBub ads for launches, particularly. Um, I, I, I think they're okay for maintaining, because if you have a good read-through rate or a good sell-through rate, then I think they're a, a decent platform as well. Uh, if book one is 99 cents, I don't think BookBub works to sell uh, anything that isn't 99 cents. Um, and what I like about it is, is that, especially for a launch, which is of particular importance, is that it allows you to have the pure also bots, the right also bots, because you're targeting specific authors in specific genres, and in targeting the specific authors in the specific genres, you are um, kind of training Amazon early on who to promote your books to. Um, I found that, you know, I have certain kind of authors who are in within my wheelhouse. Um, and if I target them, uh, um, the, the ads are quite cheap and the readership is quite cheap. Uh, although they're not necessarily the authors that I really expect. So uh, just as an example, um, Orlando Sanchez I feel he and I are, especially with my male-driven series um, and his um, and his male uh, his his series um, that like they're quite not Siri series like Siri. It's my accent and Siri just keeps acting. Playing all songs. Sorry about that. Sorry. Um. <laughs> I love technology. Yeah, I know. And it happens all the time, uh, you know, and I use that word 
multiple books in a line. Uh, <laughs> she turns on and starts to do things. Um, uh, so, it, it, like, you know, I always thought that he and I were, you know, it would work to kind of, you know, especially because our also, my also bots are filled with his books a lot of the time. Uh, but no, he's terrible for targeting. And I don't quite understand why. Whereas other authors, like, for example, and I'm speaking for me specifically, like uh, Martha Carr or Stephanie Fox, are fantastic targeting uh, choices. And I've, both, I've spoken to all three about this. So I feel comfortable actually saying their names. Um, but yeah, so like, and it works really well. And so the big thing about BookBub is, is you really got to test, 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 test and be willing to spend on the testing and be willing to try multiple different images, especially where using these images, you know, you kind of target an individual author. That's one piece of advice. Um, have at least four or five images that you're going to test per individual author at $2 a day. Let it run for one or two days. But by the end of that, you know which image works best for this author. And if you repeat that with three or four authors, you'll know which image works best, generally speaking. You'll also have a good idea amongst these particular authors you're testing with if they work for you in general. But once you kind of nail down the image that works, then it's about trying different authors, again, at a very low spend, $2 a day, $3 a day. And very quickly, you'll start to see which authors work for you and which authors don't. And if you use... And I'm not actually sure if this is against terms and conditions. So if it is, forgive me. Uh, I'm not, you know, disclaimer. I'm not advising you do this. <laughs> I have no idea. I do do this. Uh, if you use affiliate links, you can actually see your conversion rates. Right? And so what I'll do, do you know if it's against terms and conditions to use an affiliate link with BookBub ad? I feel like I've seen somewhere that... I again, I don't. No one hold me to it. I feel like I've seen somewhere that it's fine, but don't hold me to it. Yeah, I think it's fine with ads, not fine with newsletter. I, I, it's a bit. Of, I'm not quite yeah, sure. Not, not general promotion, I don't think. But yeah, I, I'm not. I don't quite know myself. So this is why I'm saying: look into yourself and assess what your level of risk is. Um, but I'll use affiliate links, and I'll get to see what my conversion rates are. And so through about $200 of testing per book, I generally can get my conversion rate down to about a one in nine. And, uh, and I can generally get my cost per click down to about 30 cents, which isn't the best, right? I mean, you certainly can get much cheaper in, um, with Facebook uh, and, and AMS if you know what you're doing. But when you have read through, when it is a launch, and when you're aiming at getting your also bots right, uh, it, it's a perfectly acceptable ad spend for me, at least. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's hard to kind of explain it without showing screens and pointing at things. But generally speaking, test one author at a time. Make sure you have multiple images, low ad spend tests, patience, and keep as best track of the data as you can. Because uh, you're not going to get anywhere unless you're keeping track of that. Absolutely, I I have so many questions to ask you, and this is going to be frustrating because I'm aware that obviously we we're on a bit of a not a time limit, but you've got a place that you need to be, and I've got a a few more questions in the next section that I'm I'm eager to get to. So before we get into um, that section, I do want to just ask one final question for myself, which is, why do you write? A, yeah, it's, uh, I, I love that. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I, I know that like when I start to become difficult around the house, my wife will hand me my um, my backpack with my laptop in it and say, go, uh, you know, just get out of the house and go right. Um, why right? That's a, a great question. Uh, like... I can say with all honesty, it's the only thing I've ever wanted to do since I was eight years old. Like that, that I can, that I can say unequivocally. Like I, I knew since I was eight that all I wanted to do was tell stories. And, um, and it all, it started with writing this story, uh, 
that was basically a mashup of Superman meets Robotech. If you guys, uh, <laughs> Superman, everyone knows Superman, but Robotech is kind of, um, you know, it's not, not everyone knows Robotech, but basically, you know, and I wrote this, um, I, I think it was like an 18 page short story. I was eight years old, you know, and my parents just were, were like, what is this? And so they really encouraged me to keep writing and, um, and then, you know, and it was just something I, I just kept doing and I, reading and writing. It was just something that I really had to do to feel, uh, good really, you know, like if I ever felt down, I either pick up a book and read or write a story I would immediately change my, whatever funk I was in right around. And, uh, but I think I had the typical author angst of, am I good enough? And, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And, um, what, what changed it for me was from being a hobby to being a, like, to saying like, do or die, there is no plan B was when my wife got pregnant and I just went, holy, can I swear on this? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm about to be a dad. Like, what the am I going to do with that? Right. You know? And, um, and then, I, I realized that like, if there was one thing I wanted to, to tell my child was that, you know, hey, I, I was able to provide, and, you know, give you what you needed as a growing up. And I was able to do it, doing what I love would be a complete life for me. And so, you know, it'd be something that like I could, you know, proudly look back at my, my time spent and say, yeah, I, I, I did it. Um, and so then it just became a do or die when my wife got pregnant, which was really freaky to my wife because, you know, I had a full-time paying job that paid really well. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to leave all that behind and start writing full-time. And she was just like, yeah, I'm pregnant. And I'm like, ah, don't worry about it. <laughs> And luckily, she she was she was on board because she, she knew and she knew what I was like, and you know, so she she ba she basically said, "Yeah, go for it, um, go for it." I know that if it doesn't work out, you'll get practical eventually. Do it, right. do it now or else, you know. And so I did, and uh, yeah, I am really happy I did. Like, I'm glad I took the leap. That's beautiful. So. It's a nice way to to wrap round up that section. I'm I'm now going to jump into. So uh, as I said to you before the show, we've got some questions from our patrons over at patreon.com forward slash a great writer share. Um, people who have specifically got questions for yourself. So I'm going to dive straight into this first one from David Hines, who says, "How do you craft an ending? Is it something you already know, or does it develop organically?" I always know my endings. Everything that I write, I've never written a story where I didn't know how it ended. Actually, that's not true. I <laughs> know how it ended. And oddly enough, it's probably my best reviewed book. Although on a personal level, I don't particularly like it. Um, uh, that, that book really literally quite almost killed me. Um, uh, well, literally, I shouldn't be so dramatic. I <laughs> got into my head, but like there were just days where I was like pulling out my hair, going, I can't get this to work. Uh, um, so I always know the ending, and I always, I always like to. So when you're talking about a series ending versus an individual book ending, so individual book endings for me are always, you know, what what has the hero accomplished? that um, will propel it forward and how does the hero feel about that? And the hero doesn't always feel good about what they've accomplished. Like quite often the hero's like, you know, yeah, I saved the, the children, but I have literally put myself in a position where I'm screwed, right? You know, like I'm a wanted fugitive and all these kind of repercussions start coming out of it. And now I have to Traverse hell to do X, Y, or Z. Urban fantasy all makes sense. Um, uh, but then there's the series ending. And then the series ending for me ha is always about giving the hero something that they need. So one of my characters, um, she killed her father. And it was something that, like, 
you know, deeply affected her for her, her, her entire life up, you know, in, in the story, right? And so the, the ending to one series was she got to speak to her father um, and kind of ask for forgiveness, uh, apologize for, you know, killing him, so to speak. And, um, and that, was, that was always good. I, like, I knew that scene was going to happen. Uh, before I started writing the first word of that entire series, I knew that she was going to have that that moment. I didn't really know what was going to happen in that conversation per se. Yeah, so that's that's what I did. And uh, in fact, I even know the last line to the entire Gone God World universe. Uh, when it all ends, the very last line will be, "It took you long enough." Wow, fair enough. Yeah, it will, it makes sense, and the, uh, um, it, it hopefully will be an impactful line because it, you know, it kind of echoes this this grand subplot that just kind of, you know, reverberates throughout the entire series. And so, yeah. perfect. Uh, John Cronshaw asks, "You've got one hundred dollars to spend on marketing a new book. Where do you spend your cash?" That's a that's a great question, John. <laughs> um, I would I would spend it on an editor. Like I would spend it on making sure the book is as good as it can be. Uh, when you're talking about such a limited budget, really, what you've got to be doing then is screaming it from the hilltops in whatever way you can. Whether that's uh, you know uh, convince you know getting on podcasts, uh, social media posts, um, whatever it is, uh, but I would spend it on kind of fine tuning it because at the end of the day, um, like if you can just drive the right kind of traffic to your book and you got a good cover and a good book description and a good page one, that's all you really need. And I mean, you, you have to kind of think of it like Amazon thinks of it. I, and it, I should put a caveat that this is what I believe Amazon thinks of it as. I don't know, and I could be completely wrong. And I, I, I can hear some you know, authors way more successful than me for way longer screaming, you got it wrong, you bastard. It's like, I, shut up, I know what I'm talking about. Sorry, uh, wait, I'm gonna say that out loud? Um, <laughs> Um, but it's basically this, it's what is the conversion rate, right? So, you know, Amazon is keeping track of how many people are visiting your book page. And if they're seeing a certain conversion rate, whatever that is, I, I mean, I can't, I have no idea what that number is, but if one in 50 people who visit your book page buy, well, they're going to start pushing you. And it's going to be slower, it's slow at first, and you know, and if that ratio still maintains, they're going to keep pushing you, and it's going to snowball and snowball and snowball. So, so how do you get those conversions? Well, you got to have a great cover, you got to have a great book description, you got to have a great couple, first couple pages that really hook your reader, and then you got to get the right readers there. Because if I'm writing urban fantasy, I'm not going to market to horror writers. Uh, they're not going to convert. Uh, so I need to find urban fantasy readers, people who are looking for this. And Amazon will eventually, I mean, Amazon as in like the, you know, artificial intelligence, search engine, whatever they use, I have no idea what it is, um, will eventually start going, ah, oh, the conversion rates make sense, let's keep pushing it. And, and I have evidence of this in, in this one sense of my first book, The Gone God World, completely mismarketed it to the romance uh, readership. And if you see my early reviews on that book, um, we, by the way, I unpublished that book, but uh, and then republished it and got full new reviews, new ASI and the whole shebang, right? But on the original reviews, there was a lot of like, not my cup of tea, but I love the story. And what was happening was that they were buying, but they weren't reading through. And so I wasn't getting the Amazon support. When I targeted better and did get the Amazon support. It was a whole different uh, ballgame. 
Uh, Jen Mitchell, our mutual friend, asks, Your Gone Gold World started out with two related series, but I noticed that you recently brought in S.W. Clark as a co-author for a third series and that you've begun some collaboration projects with LMBPN and others. Can you share a little bit about your decision to move your universe and your career in that direction? I mean, we've kind of touched on this in the interview, but if you've got sort of any last last little words on that before we get into the quick fire round. Yeah, so it was just basically um, working with LMVPN with the Middengard series in particular. I have one more project that I'm working on with another author. And in both instances, um, uh, like I looked at it from the perspective of can I learn Right. You know, so the money obviously is an appeal and working with these heavy hitters is an appeal. But uh, the real motivation was, can I learn? Can I like take what they teach me, the principles of writing and the principles of marketing and apply it to my own stuff? And if the answer was yes, then I was happy to collaborate within limit. Right. I mean, I only have so many hours per day. Um, and so that's why I started doing it. And plus, uh, I just needed to do something else that wasn't Gone God World for a little bit. Um, it was, uh, so that's why I kind of took a break and did a, uh, with LMVPM for a bit um, while the co authoring series in the Gone God World was happening. So there wasn't like a, a break in the um, Gone God World in terms of like books coming out, but there was a break for me because I could do something else. Um, and yeah, it's been amazing, like working with Anderley, for example. I mean, his approach to writing is is so, you know, it's so different than um, than mine. And and you know, like he's like, well, are you doing this in every chapter, and are you doing that in every chapter? And I'll let him say what this and that are, but um, I'm not, not <laughs> for what's proprietary. But you know, and it, it is awesome. Like, holy, holy shit! I never thought of it like that. Like, okay, yeah, I will do this, and sure enough, it works. You know, so. Perfect. Okay, so now we're going to go into a quick fire round. I've got 10 questions for you that you've got to try and answer as quickly as possible. Um, it's, all in, it's all in fun, so don't worry too much if, if the pressure gets to you. We've had some people pass on questions, um, but are you ready? I'm ready. Perfect. Okay. Ice cream or custard? Oh, ice cream. What's your favorite place in the world? Uh, Wadi El Haytan. It's a, um, a whale bone... Um, uh, desert or a desert filled with whale bones in Egypt. Would you rather learn to read Braille or learn to read or to learn to do sign language? Oh, sign language, and I got something amazing coming regarding sign language in an upcoming book in 2020. Shameless plug. <laughs> Intriguing. Harry Potter or Star Wars? Neither. What was the last film to make you laugh? Oh, that's a great question. Um, uh, I, I, stranger than fiction. One book that you'd recommend? Dune. Food of choice at a cinema? It was um, uh, the, the cookie filled uh, M&Ms, you know, but then uh, I had a health scare, so I had to get healthy. So now <laughs> plain, boring popcorn. Uh, oceans or mountains? Oh, mountains. Oceans are deadly. Terrifying. Things What's a Christ- <laughs> What's a Christmas present you wish you'd got but never received? Oh, wow. Um... <laughs> I love this question. Yeah, there's so much. I, I, I like uh, basically like completing my Smurf He-Man, Transformers uh, collections, where I had a lot of the pieces, but I never got them all. So it would just be the completion of those collections. I do have my Skeletor, which I'm very happy about. Nice. And what's your favorite star sign? Well, Gemini. Fantastic. That's all of them. Ten questions. How do you feel? Excellent. I'm ready for more. (laughs) Well, maybe (laughs) on the next one. Um, but just to finish up, where can our listeners find out more about yourself and everything you're working on? Sure. So Rami Vance. Uh, so Rami, uh, R-A-M-Y, unlike that charlatan Rami Milak, who spells it with an I. Um, um, so Rami Vance. Uh, and you can find me on Amazon. Or if you'd like to find us, uh, us it's, it is us now on um, uh, Facebook. We have a pretty uh, kick-ass group uh, called Rami Vance's 
House of the Gone God Damned. So fantastic. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. I appreciate your time. It's been fantastic. Well, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Sweet. And thank you everyone for listening and we'll see you next week. Take care, guys. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Great Writers Share podcast. Next week, we'll be joined by independent filmmaker John Freeman discussing writing for the screen, breaking into the film industry and balancing it all around a full-time job. Don't forget you can get early access to every episode of the Great Writers Share podcast and the chance to ask upcoming guests any of your questions just by becoming a patron of the show. All you need to do is visit www.patreon.com forward slash Great Writers Share and support the show for as little as $1 a month. One more time, that's www.patreon.com forward slash Great Writers Share. Until next time. <laughs>